and um, we have a lot of attendees, which is nice to see. So um, I think it's a good time to get started. Hello, everyone. I am Rosa Maurice Clark, Communications and Events Manager here at CrossRef. Uh, we wanted to start by welcoming you all to today's event, and uh, thank you for coming. We've titled it Smart Alone, Brilliant Together, which is one of our truths, and we'll come to those later. Just a couple of things to mention before we get started. As usual with online events, to reduce background noise, we have everyone muted. If you have um, any questions during the event, you can write them down um, into the question and answer box, the Q&A box, and we will answer you there. Um, we ask that you please use the Q&A box for questions versus the chat window. Questions added to the chat window um, tend to get lost, and using the Q&A box makes it easier for us to manage the questions and know uh, which ones have been answered. The event today is going to be recorded and we will share the recording later along with uh, presentation slides. I'm going to take just a moment here to uh, take you through our agenda for today. To start, uh, I hope uh, everyone is settled now and comfortable and ready to spend a little time with us today. As you can see, um, we have a nice mix of topics to talk about today. My colleagues will introduce themselves and at the start of their sessions. And they will be talking about the big picture, community and collaboration, product strategy, governance, and then we'll get into the annual meeting and the election before we wrap up the event. We will have time for question and answers after each speaker. So again, please add your questions to the Q&A box. I should mention that not only should you be able to see the questions, but if someone has asked something that uh, you're interested in, you can upload it and comment there as well. This will help us to see um, that more than one person is interested in that particular question. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so Ed, may I uh, pass over to you? Thank you, Rosa, and uh, uh, welcome everyone. I'm just gonna switch over to uh, take over uh, control of this, the slides here. And Hold on one moment. Great. Well, thank you all for joining today. Uh, I'm happy to be speaking to you today as the uh, new uh, Crossref Executive uh, Director. Uh, some of you may have heard earlier this year that I had decided to leave uh, Crossref and that was announced in uh, uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, but then in July, I was very happy to announce that I had decided uh, to stay and that the board had had accepted my uh, staying, which I was very, very happy about. And um, what happened between those two events with me deciding to leave and then and then staying was uh, uh, a big one was the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, when that got underway, of course, there was a lot to, to, to do and cope with. And I was very impressed with the resilience of the Crossroad team, uh, the organization. Uh, the board and and our whole community and realized that uh, it's a great group of people and a great community uh, that I wanted to keep uh, working with. And um, Crossref has a very important mission. We're going to be talking about that today. So I decided I wanted to keep leading uh, Crossref. Uh, and I thought it was something I could do effectively and do well, leading through these tough times and, and, and into the future. Uh, also in July, uh, the board uh, passed some key strategic resolutions. Uh, which I'm going to be talking about uh, during my talk today, but very happy to be here uh, and uh, speaking uh, to you uh, as, as Crossref uh, Executive uh, Director. So the first thing uh, I wanted to do uh, was welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, wherever you're coming from uh, in the world. Thank you for, for joining. If it's an unusual uh, time zone, thank you. Um, uh, I want to welcome all of you. It's the 2020 annual meeting of Crossref members. It's our first online annual meeting, uh, and it's fantastic to have uh, so many people here. And uh, this is the uh, highest attendance we've, we've ever had at a meeting. Usually we are face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, which, which has its benefits, but I think the inclusivity of doing this online uh, is, is, is really great, and we're already uh, well beyond 
uh, uh, the numbers who normally uh, are able to attend a face-to-face -face meeting. So uh, people have been able to attend uh, without the time and expense uh, and carbon footprint of traveling. So I, so I think that's one of the uh, positive things here. So I will say officially uh, the meeting uh, is now open. <clears throat> one of the important things that happens at the meeting is the board election. Uh, it's a very important part of our governance. Uh, we're a nonprofit membership association uh, and it's one member, one vote. So all members uh, have a say in who is on the board. Uh, we've got a great slate of candidates. Uh, and at the end of today's meeting, uh, we're gonna be announcing the results uh, of the election, uh, hopefully counting of the votes uh, in the cross ref election should be a bit quicker than the, uh, the US election and a little less uh, contentious. Uh, most of our members participating in the board uh, election have opted to provide a proxy and cast their votes in advance. Uh, but if you are the voting member representing your member organization and haven't already voted, uh, please do so now using the link uh, previously uh, received via email from eBallot, uh, our voting platform. So if you're the voting contact, you will have gotten an email uh, and ho hopefully have already voted. If not, you can st still vote. Uh, if you're the voting contact and you previously voted, uh, but uh, would like to supersede your proxy vote and cast a new vote now, uh, you can email uh, uh, Lucy, who's our secretary and director of finance and operations, who you'll be hearing from uh, later, but her email is here uh, on the screen. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, she'll give you information about uh, superseding your proxy. But otherwise, if uh, you're not the voting contact, then you don't have anything uh, to worry about at, at, at the moment. And I uh, just wanted to let everybody know that uh, voting is closing at uh, 1530 UTC, so uh, half past uh, the hour, so just, just over uh, 15 minutes uh, from now. So keep that in mind if you uh, haven't, haven't voted yet. So on to uh, the main part of what I wanted to talk about today, uh, look, looking at the big picture. So this has been a really unusual year. Uh, they're very challenging and uncertain times. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has upended a lot of things uh, and it's meant additional stress and worry for people and organizations. Um, in Crossref's case back in March, uh, we closed our two offices and moved to fully remote work. 30% um, of our staff were already working fully remotely. Uh, but having everybody uh, work that way uh, has required some changes. Uh, we suspended all staff travel. That's going through at least uh, next year, the beginning of next year. Uh, we've moved to virtual live events uh, like this one and others and webinars and, and, and board meetings as well. And uh, we've also uh, shown flexibility and supported our staff uh, by recognizing that we aren't just working uh, from home full time. Uh, as you can see uh, where I'm working from uh, my uh, daughter's uh, old bedroom uh, in Oxford. And uh, we're, we're working from home during a pandemic. And, and some of us are uh, in, in lockdowns and, and various other conditions. Uh, maybe their kids home from school, uh, family, friends, and communities uh, need, need support. Uh, so, so it's unusual times and we've tried to take account of that. And um, uh, on top of the pandemic, there are other societal issues. Uh, in the US, the Black Lives Matter protests uh, reverberated around the world, highlighting the need to look at making systemic changes to address inequality and racism, and working harder on, on diversity and community at our organizations and uh, in, in, in our community. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the meeting, um, about what we've been doing on, on that front. But uh, this is not a time for, for business as usual. Uh, we need to come together, work together, <coughs> listen, collaborate, uh, be flexible and, and innovate. So today we're going to be talking about what Crossref has been doing, what's been changing. Uh, this has involved the staff, the board, uh, our membership, and the broader community. And a key thing for me uh, is what Crossref does is more important than ever. So I'll be talking about our mission and, uh, uh, and how we've been responding to the pandemic. But the bottom line is that uh, open research and open infrastructure are essential to improving scholarly research and communication, making content more uh, discoverable, uh, and really the ultimate goal is advancing uh, human knowledge and with the announcement of this uh, uh, positive results in one of the vaccine trials, that's, that's a great example of how, how critical research is uh, for humanity and uh, we, can, we can play a part uh, in this and our whole community can play a part. So that's the, the, the very big picture, uh, but I wanted to talk about more specifically some of the things uh, that <coughs> Crossref has been doing this year. 
So uh, as many organizations have done, uh, we thought about uh, what we could do to help accelerate research. Uh, many of our member publishers have opened up content and created specialized resources that have been very useful. And in April, Crossref made available a free public data file of all Crossref uh, metadata, all the public metadata. So not including closed or, or limited references. Um, uh, so while we've had open APIs and search interfaces and we make metadata available without restriction, this is the first time we've made all the metadata available uh, in, in this way. Uh, and then uh, in uh, April, we provided a way for publishers to highlight content uh, that was available for text mining, either as OA content or uh, temporarily free, uh, free content. And then another big change uh, that I wanted to highlight uh, is that the board approved this last year, but it came into effect at the start of this year, is that we uh, dropped the Crossmark fee. So Crossmark is the service that uh, allows extra information to be provided about content to highlight the status of that content and, and whether it's changed and other information about metadata, about what the publisher has done to ensure the quality of that content, whether it's uh, the type of peer review, uh, clinical trial numbers, other types of data can be included. Uh, but the board made this uh, change to encourage best practice and reducing barriers to providing better metadata and, and more complete metadata to Crossref. So a key part of uh, what Crossmark provides are uh, corrections and retractions. And this is incredibly useful information. Uh, we've got uh, 5,100 retractions and over 78,000 corrections that have actually been reported through, uh, through the Crossmark uh, system that's available through, through our normal APIs. <laughs> and it's displayed um, when you click on the uh, Crossmark icon in a PDF or on a, on a publisher website. Uh, but now that the fee has been dropped, we're really encouraging everybody uh, to, to take a look at this. Uh, this is incredibly important information because it shows how publishers maintain the scholarly record. Uh, and there should be more widespread use of this data. And particularly uh, with rapid publication during the pandemic, uh, there's a heightened concern about correcting and uh, retracting um, uh, content that's, that's been published. And uh, so really encourage everybody to take a look at this. It's very important for uh, maintaining the scholarly record and making this available uh, more uh, widely and having more of this data available, I think would be a really, really positive, uh, positive development. So talk to somebody at Crossref, check the website if you're not already uh, participating in, uh, in Crossmark. So more generally, uh, Crossref is doing pretty well considering everything. So uh, grant identifiers are rolling out. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, funders are joining, joining Crossref now. Uh, membership is growing. Uh, it's 19% up on last year. Content is growing about eight to 9% up on 2019. Uh, we've gone through a big similarity check transition uh, and that's, that's been very successful. Um, uh, we've moved to virtual events. Uh, so we've been engaging with members uh, on, a, on a wide basis this year. Um, we moved uh, to 100% work from home. Uh, we're engaging with members and community and, 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 and listening to be aware of uh, any potential problems, any issues that our members are having. Uh, and uh, we've been working on the 2021 budget. Uh, the board is having a meeting after this annual meeting today and carrying on uh, tomorrow. And uh, we've, we've budgeted conservatively for 2021. Uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty, but you'll be hearing from Lucy a little bit later with more details on uh, the financials. We've seen uh, a big shift in the membership globally. <clears throat> We've been, we'll be hearing about this from Ginny later, but I just wanted to highlight a, a change in where our member uh, revenue uh, comes from. So this chart shows uh, content registration uh, and membership revenue uh, by membership tier comparing 2011 to 2020 based on an estimate of what we think the full full year is gonna be. And you can see that uh, on the left-hand side here in the, if it's sort of orangey yellowy for you, uh, it's uh, that's 2011, the blue is 2020, and we have the largest fee category on the left-hand side. This is uh, organizations with over $500 million in revenue. And on the right-hand side, we've got the $275 category and sponsored organizations, uh, which are a million dollars and below. And you can see that obviously from 2011 to um, 2020, there's been a huge growth in, uh, 
the uh, lower fee category here uh, because we're now up to uh, 13,000 members, many of them in this uh, lower category. We've expanded globally. It's been really a fantastic, uh, fantastic development. And most of our revenue comes from, uh, from our members in terms of content registration. Uh, being a membership association, that, that, that makes sense. Uh, and so, so this shows the, um, uh, uh, the, the change that we've had uh, over the year over the years and just to break that down into the different tiers uh the three large tiers have gone from 56 percent of revenue to 40 percent of revenue uh middle tiers not as much of a change 20 percent to 16 <clears> percent <throat> and then the small uh tier uh three smallest are were 25 percent and they've grown to 44 uh, percent of revenue but you can see that even in the large category uh that's it's still grown uh just not as much as the other categories so I think that's a reflection that that more content is being published uh, than ever before, and it's uh, then it, and it's uh, continuing to grow. And there's some issues in here that maybe our membership and fees committee uh, is going to be taking a look at in in the future about how we allocate membership tiers and things like that. But uh, but overall, I think this is a sign of the uh, success and growth that we've seen uh, over the last, uh, uh, particularly five or six years, where that growth has really. Uh, uh, globally has really accelerated. Some other things that have been going on, uh, we've expanded content types. Most recently, we added preprints a couple of years ago. This year, it's been grants. Uh, we've expanded the metadata and the links uh, that we've uh, been collecting, and this includes uh, relationships. So I mentioned corrections and retractions, uh, but license information, funding information, ORCID IDs, uh, data site DOIs, a preprint to version of record connections, and uh, uh, ROAR IDs for affiliations. So we're gonna be hearing about some of these things some more, but there's there's been a lot going on. I did just wanna highlight uh, with uh, with ROAR, uh, this is, uh, we've been working on this uh, with CDL, California Digital Library and, and Datasite. And uh, it's a uh, open uh, community run, uh, open registry for, for organizations, the research organization registry. Uh, and it, in our particular case, it's uh, got applications for affiliation metadata because we do in our schema have a place for affiliations, but uh, we have not been collecting uh, affiliations based on uh, uh, unique open identifiers. And so ROAR will enable us uh, to do this. So we are asking publishers to start to get ready uh, because with the new uh, schema that Crossref's bringing in, um, uh, at the end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, we're going to be uh, collecting uh, uh, ROAR IDs for affiliation data, and that will really help round out uh, the metadata that Crossref collects and enable a lot of good, uh, good services around that. So looking overall at the <coughs> content that's been registered, uh, we're up to over 118 million content items, and as I said, it's about an 8 or 9% eight or uh, growth over, overall compared to the same period in 2019. Uh, and I've uh, just highlighted a couple of things here that preprints pre has been the fastest growing, uh, about half a million uh, preprints. And also in terms of those relationships, we have the preprint to article links. So the preprint uh, publishers uh, in the metadata register uh, a relationship to uh, from the preprint to versions of record that get published that are related uh, to, uh, to, to that preprint. Uh, and uh, so we'll be looking at ways of, 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 of making that system better, but you can see actually we're sort of maybe catching up a little bit. The, the preprint article links are actually growing faster than the, uh, the number of preprints uh, pre -prints coming in. And you can see with the number of grants, just, just an, initial, uh, an initial start. So we're still, we're still working on this. Uh, and uh, so hopefully in 2021, we're gonna see, see that ramping up, uh, ramping up a lot more. So I talked about relationships. We don't capture a huge amount of relationships uh, at the moment, but this is going to be a real focus over the next uh, couple of years. We'll also be focusing on <laughs> different versions of preprints and articles, but also uh, translations as well, connecting those in the metadata and, and establishing the relationships. As uh, Crossref's Ginny Hendricks has said, uh, the nature of re the relationship between two objects is as useful as the objects themselves. And so this is going to be something that we're talking about a lot more because Crossref has really shifted and it's no longer about just making bilateral uh, arrangements uh, between publishers. So we started off with reference linking, 
uh, 20 years ago, and it was to make that uh, more efficient. But our infrastructure capturing all these uh, relationships in this wider set of data uh, is now helping manage multilateral relationships in a whole network of identifiers, <coughs> metadata, and uh, relationships. And this is becoming more critical, as I said at the start, around open research and, uh, and, and open infrastructure. And so we've started talking about this as the uh, the research nexus. The nexus is a series of uh, uh, connections between two or more things, right? So, so this is really captures uh, the way we're looking at, um, at what we're doing. And so we want to be able to declare relationships between publications, grants, data, people, organizations, uh, all sorts of research objects, uh, uh, data. We're not, we're not the ones collecting all of this ourselves. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute because there are other organizations involved and, and people, uh, organizations that we're collaborating with who, who are a very important part of this, but we want to uh, relate everything. And this is really an expanded version of capturing the scholarly record, which we've been doing for many years. It's, it's gonna help with uh, uh, reproducibility. It's gonna uh, dem help with demonstrating compliance with funder and institutional mandates, uh, but it's just gonna make discovery of content uh, uh, a better and also assessing the impact of, of content uh, post publication and hopefully creating a, a virtuous uh, circle uh, where that can feed back into improving research uh, itself. So I also wanted to just touch on uh, that, that, that this year saw Crossref's uh, 20th anniversary. On January uh, 19th, uh, 2000, uh, we were incorporated as a new not-for-profit registered in New York State called Publishers International Linking Association, Inc., uh, but were more commonly referred to as Crossref at the time, Crossref with a uppercase R. And then on February 2nd, there was a press release uh, that came out uh, with a number of important announcements, uh, one of them about the new executive director, some guy called Ed Pence, and uh, the board of directors. And we were very happy that we had 22 members at the time, which was uh, uh, not as many as the uh, over 13,000 that we have now, but um, uh, we've achieved a, a huge amount since then. Uh, and it was, certainly wasn't a foregone conclusion that, that we would be, would be successful. <clears throat> and so this year we haven't done any celebratory uh, events. Um, uh, we had been planning some, some dinners and things, uh, but, uh, but that's okay, we've been focusing on the the basics, we've been uh, uh, working on our strategy uh, and, uh, and it's uh, probably saved some money because we haven't had to have those, those, uh, those events. But I did just wanna, wanna mark it here and then note also, again, not, not to upset uh, Ginny here, but um, this is the original Crossref logo. I don't know, some people may remember this, but even though we did retire it a number of years ago, it is still, uh, I still have a fondness for it, the, wa the wavy line logo. Uh, with 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 the blue and the black, but it's things change, and we've moved on uh, from there. So uh, last year, as our twentieth anniversary was approaching, uh, we took a look back uh, at uh, uh, our twenty year history. We did some research with members and the community about the value of Crossref, uh, and then we had discussions and and feedback sessions at our uh, annual meeting last year. Live 19 in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, and then all of this fed into strategy discussions. Uh, and we had them at the Crossref board meetings, uh, which were uh, shorter, but more of them because we went to virtual meetings in March. And uh, thanks to the uh, board for their flexibility and adapting to this. And it's actually been very, uh, very effective. So we've had more frequent, but shorter meetings. So we had meetings in March, May, June, July, and uh, October of this year. And we're having the, the final meeting of the year. Uh, today, uh, today and tomorrow. So, um, but one of the questions that came up at Live 19 that was interesting, it was from uh, Todd Toller's talk uh, from Wiley, uh, who is who is on the Crossref board. He was elected at last year's uh, uh, meeting. Uh, and it's, is Crossref a scholarly infrastructure provider or a publisher services organization? Of course, these things don't have to be mutually exclusive, but it does raise the issue of uh, what is the primary driver uh, for, the, for the organization. Uh, and there is an answer to this question. Uh, Crossref is an open scholarly infrastructure provider uh, and uh, that has guided uh, some of the strategic decisions that we've made recently. Uh, and so I wanna give some, some background uh, on that. Um, <clears throat> we went back to uh, 
uh, back to the beginning in our certificate of incorporation, which is our founding document. Uh, and in this document, the purpose of Crossrip is uh, outlined as uh, to promote the development and cooperative use of new and innovative technologies to speed and facilitate scientific and other scholarly research. Uh, it's a broad mission and note that it doesn't mention reference linking, it doesn't mention DOIs. Uh, and uh, so it gives us uh, an initial starting point of this, this broad mission. Uh, but the certificate of incorporation also created Crossref as a membership association. And we also have our uh, uh, incorporation as a, a legal entity. It operates on a couple of levels. So I just wanted to explain that a little bit uh, that we are a New York state nonprofit uh, and, and it's non-stock meaning no, one's own, no one owns us. Uh, we, and we're not commercial. Our purpose is to fulfill our mission in a sustainable way, but not, not to generate profits. Uh, and our being a membership association is further defined uh, uh, in the bylaws, which state that membership is open to any organization that publishes professional and scholarly materials and content. So this is very broad. It's uh, changed somewhat over the years, but um, uh, we have started to think of our members uh, more as uh, many of them are organizations that publish uh, but don't think of themselves necessarily as, as publishers. So this now includes uh, funders, NGOs, government agencies, societies, universities, and, and other research organizations. Uh, we're also a 501c6 tax exempt organization in the US. <clears throat> 501c6 is for uh, trade associations or, or, or business leagues. Uh, and it's important to note that we have an obligation to provide benefit to the broader non-member community uh, and that individual benefit to members is incidental to, to those broader benefits. Uh, so it's not, we're not set up as a, a private club to benefit individual members. Uh, but of course, we've shown over many years that um, uh, benefiting our members uh, is benefiting the whole, uh, the broader community through, through the services that, uh, that we provide. So finally, this takes us up to uh, the discussions that the board was having around all of these issues and uh, at the July meeting, uh, the board passed a couple of a few few important resolutions. Just to note, I uh, hadn't put a link in here, but the board resolutions are all available on, on our website. Uh, and uh, the motions here uh, commits Crossref to working with other infrastructure organizations to improve the scholarly research ecosystem. And it highlights that Crossref is committed to open scholarly infrastructure. The second motion calls for a wide ranging exploration of these things. And then also we've set up a uh, board uh, leadership team uh, committee to, uh, to, uh, to, take, to take this work forward. So really just to summarize some of the key points from this, it's about collaborative development around open scholarly infrastructure. We wanna benefit the wider research community. Uh, as I said, look at a broad range of different areas uh, to, to look at efficiencies and synergies. Uh, and we have a committee uh, that's been uh, having a lot of discussions. There have been lots of discussions going on with, with other organizations, but uh, this is uh, very, very early stages uh, right now. So it's, it's a still developing area. So I think we will hopefully hear some more about this next year. But one thing I wanted to highlight was coming out of the statement around open scholarly infrastructure, it raises the question, so what is open scholarly infrastructure? So we've, we've been looking, in that, looking at that. And the board is gonna be discussing at its meeting tomorrow, uh, this issue of some principles around open scholarly infrastructure. Uh, there's a set of 16 principles that are being reviewed and discussed. Uh, they're based on uh, some things that Crossref already does in practice. Some are aspirational, some would need some work, but they're divided into a couple of key areas around governance, sustainability and uh, insurance. Uh, so I won't, I don't have time to go into all of these today, but uh, as, as this moves forward, wherever we wind up with these, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, uh, communicating about them uh, with, the, with the community. Uh, but really the goal here is to, um, uh, having a set of principles is really important to provide a framework with our discussions with other organizations to, to, and, and, and to build trust and to, to make sure that we uh, have a common vision of, of where we are headed with open scholarly infrastructure. Uh, we are talking to other organizations uh, and we don't wanna forget that the goal here is, the problem we're trying to solve is a more integrated and interoperable um, uh, infrastructure to make things easier 
for the researchers and organizations involved in scholarly research and communications. Um, uh, we want them to be uh, sustainable, neutral and independent, uh, and work in the most efficient way possible to reduce duplicative activities and, and processes. So uh, we did a little bit of a environmental scan. Uh, these are some of the related organizations that CrossRef already works with, uh, that we are, are uh, talking to, some of them we're, we're planning to talk to, uh, but it's, 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 it's really open. So uh, we're, we're happy to talk to uh, many, many different organizations. And um, this is just a, a small sample of uh, the space uh, that, that, that we're operating in, just to give you an idea of the, the type of thing that we're, um, that we're uh, working on at the moment. So uh, some of this is why we're doing this is, is obviously the strategic issues, but also some of the practical concerns around uh, uh, COVID and some of the economic pressures that may be coming. Uh, organizational fatigue. This is just a small subset that I just showed you, but there are a lot of organizations and having to organizations and there are a lot of membership organizations and it's hard to, to join and, and keep up with all of them. So uh, there may be some options here uh, for greater efficiency, for centralizing uh, some things. And really it ties in with the theme of this meeting that we're each smart alone, uh, but we could be brilliant or more brilliant together because many of these organizations uh, are uh, brilliant. Uh, and, uh, but, but we wanna look at how we can uh, make things better. So <clears throat> to finish up, I think uh, it's our 20th anniversary. It's 2020, looking forward to Crossref 2040. Uh, what's, what's the vision? Well, we want Crossref to be part of an integrated, efficient, sustainable, comprehensive, open scholarly infrastructure. We want to capture research activities and outputs, researchers and organizations, make sure they have persistent identifiers, rich standardized metadata expressing a network of relationships available through human and machine interfaces. And then this would enable uh, an open and broadly governed research ecosystem that makes research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. And that ultimately will enable researchers to focus on research and advancing uh, human knowledge. So I think that's a, a, a great vision to, uh, uh, to take us forward and uh, yeah, should be an exciting uh, next few years. So I'll finish there, say thank you very much and um, have time for maybe a couple of quick, quick questions. Yep, so um, Ed, our colleagues have jumped in and answered a lot of the questions. And we are just about um, a couple of minutes over before Gina's hmm. presentation. So um, I think we're all set with questions there. If you want to have a look and answer, um, type in your answer, that would be great. And okay. uh, yeah. as Ginny, we go along, I can jump in there. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, Ginny, off to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just listening to that long list of um, adjectives from Ed. So we've got to be efficient, we've got to be sustainable, we've got to be open, we're going to be all the things, we're going to make it happen. Um, okay, I am going to talk about community and collaboration. I'm the Director of Member and Community Outreach at Crossref, and I'm like an old hat now because I've been here over five years. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is walk through how uh, my team, uh, which is 15 strong, is addressing the current challenges and uh, where, what we're poised to, um, to do next. Um, so here is that team, um, all very cheerful and smiling. And even throughout 2020, they have maintained that incredible um, attitude and ethos. And we, we're still... Um, handling the uh, complexities and growth of, of Crossref really, really well. Um, so a big thank you to all of the outreach team. And here, uh, maybe a bit more to the point, is what we are doing. Uh, the team is uh, divided, and this isn't everybody, of course, but there's a few areas where we uh, are focused, and uh, a huge, a, a large number of the team are focused, of course, on membership. So uh, we see around 220 new members joining each year. Uh, there's a lot of technical support that goes along with that, a lot of consultancy now, uh, and complex um, uh, discussion with members as and when they're joining and taking them from uh, doing kind of maybe the basics and getting started and leveling up to 
um, more and more services and richer metadata. So that's a big part of our, our focus. Um, of course, we run events like this and more and more lately, but we always have done um, in many languages and I'll, I'll get to a little bit of that. Um, we also look after metadata strategy because a huge part of that is listening to what our members want to do. So I'll cover that in a little bit of detail. And uh, a new area is partnerships. Um, we have uh, Jennifer Kemp now who is focused, who's always focused on service providers and the Metadata Plus program. Uh, she's also looking after key partners so we can work hand in hand with uh, large organizations to, um, to work together to improve things. And another new area is special programs. And I'll go through some of uh, those special programs that Rachel Lamy is now looking after. Um, here are some of the types of organizations we look after. Of course, uh, publishers and societies are um, always, have always been members of, of Crossref since its founding. Um, then we started to see university presses um, join. We saw more, more and more governmental departments, NGOs, um, we've always worked with the hosting platforms and the and the tracking systems very closely and, and continue to, to do that. Um, and more and more lately, we've seen um, scholars, individual authors and uh, faculty groups. So um, uh, people based out of um, the universities uh, joining Crossref as members. Uh, and that accounts for a large, a large amount of our growth. We do see news agencies, museums, pharma companies, conference organizers, but we're not, um, we're not doing anything proactive really to, to look into those areas, but we do, we do have some of those members like Bloomberg and, and people like that. Um, uh, funders, I will go into later, that has been a proactive program and it's, um, it's early days, but it's, it's going really well. So I'll cover that a little bit. Uh, here are the membership data in numbers, and this is um, just to demonstrate the scale at which Crossref is growing. So this is the number of new members that have joined each year, so not the total. So for a long while, we were seeing about 30 to 40 join every year, and then that sort of doubled um, or more than doubled um, in about 2006. And uh, in the last five, six, seven years, it's really, uh, it's really grown. So in 2019, we had two and a half thousand new members joining um, with all of their questions and all of their sort of information that we had to, that we, that we have to process and understand. And uh, we're already at 2,380 for 2020 and expect to see that um, going much higher than last year as well. Uh, the growth is, um, oh, so this is where they're coming from. And this is really interesting, just thinking in terms of uh, global, the global research landscape. Um, this is our total membership. And I think it's pretty um, interesting to see that we have the most members in Indonesia, almost 14% of Crossref members are based in Indonesia. And I know lots of you are on the, the call, even though it's not a very hospitable time zone for you. So thanks for that. Uh, we will do better about time zones in future, I promise. Um, so Indonesia, South Korea, the United States is third on our list of, um, of members at about 10%. Um, and then it gets into a sort of psychedelic stripe of all the colors at the top there. So I won't go into all of them. Um, but looking more at uh, the countries that are trending lately, so this is members who have joined um, in the last 12 months. So Indonesia is still growing. Most of our new members, or 25% of our new members approximately, are coming from Indonesia. And we also see Turkey, Brazil, India, South Korea, um, and then down to sort of the smaller end there, some uh, countries that are newly making this list are Nigeria, uh, Peru, Pakistan. Uh, as well. I think Mexico's on that list as well, that isn't labelled. Um, and here's one that um, I sent to the Crossref uh, staff yesterday to see if they could guess how, uh, well, which countries um, are on this map. There are 13 countries on this map and they represent countries where we've never had any members before, but that we have had at least one joining in the last year. So 13 new countries. 
Um, and so here's for the big reveal for the Crossref staff who, who entered the competition. <laughs> These are the 13 countries. Um, and what's really pleasing is that a lot of them are very, very large countries um, from the African continent. So um, I think this is real progress and we're really happy about that. Um, largely the growth is down to, um, I'd love to say it's all down to um, us individually. Of course, we've not been traveling around the world even before um, the pandemic this much, um, but we have about a hundred or so organizations that we call sponsors. They're part of this program where they can help um, members, I know there was a question in the Q&A about how smaller organisations can participate in Crossref and this programme, it's been, um, it was established a number of years ago, but Rachel Lammy has really scaled it up and it's now managed by Susan Collins and we have very good relationships with these 100 organisations and more members now are members of Crossref through a sponsor than are members directly to Crossref. And that, is, and that has truly enabled our um, ability to include um, publishers and members and all sorts of organizations from around the world from 139 countries in total uh, and growing clearly. Um, and there's some more sponsors as well. They're listed on our website. What they do is they help with um, local language, um, translations, they help with technical support, they help with um, administrative and, and financial support as well. So organisations on this list are, are really becoming very um, close partners of Crossref and critical um, to the accessibility of Crossref services. Uh, also responsible for the um, international growth is our 26 strong team of Crossref ambassadors. And um, I just wanted to call them out here and have, I know again, some of them are on the call um, today and just say a really big thank you. Um, not just for, it's not, a, it's, not an, it's not a passive role. They run webinars locally and they um, are working in our space, but they um, are kind of helpful as eyes and ears, bringing insights back into Crossref that um, uh, we can really listen to, learn and make changes based on, based on their feedback. Um, continuing the, the theme, uh, we have um, uh, more digital resources now and we have more non-English language resources now, but we know that needs to grow. But I wanted to show an example of, for example, this is a Crossref, um, Crossmark uh, animation and it's in Korean. Um, it's, I think, one of our most watched videos ever. And you, if you follow us on Twitter, you may have seen um, some non-English non engagement there. And again, these are usually in partnership with a sponsor or, or an ambassador or two. Um, so we're doing lots more in non-English language. And even the webinars where we run together with ambassadors, we're doing lots of Google Translate um, in the background to try, and, to try and answer everybody's questions. And um, just to, uh, to, to make that point again, but also to call out that we have a community forum and this is becoming um, really a central uh, place for members to talk to each other. So there's a, spe a special group for newly joined members to talk to each other. Um, and the ambassadors are really active in this. And of course, um, people can discuss in their own language and they don't have to go through Crossref staff um, ideally for all of the questions. So that's something we're, we're going to be growing more. And Vanessa Fairhurst is, is managing that together with Isaac Farley. Uh, so a little, uh, I think that was a, a lot of data, a lot of, um, a lot of information, um, but here it is sort of side by side, a typical member in, in 2010, and Ed, Ed showed the, um, the revenue from the different categories, but um, just from, I mean, if we're thinking about maybe personas, a typical member in 2010 had 100,000 DOIs or more, um, but nowadays really 100 DOI records is the norm. A typical member has just 100 DOI records. Um, they join via a sponsor rather than directly, as I say, 
and their first language is not English. They use manual content registration routes. They don't use the direct HTTPS post, for example. Um, they are very likely hosted um, on open journal systems. And we'll talk later about our, our partnership with the Public Knowledge Project to really support those, um, those members, those typical members now. Uh, as I said, they're generally an individual scholar or um, academic based. And of course, they're not just um, looking for journals, looking at journals, they, they're publishing reviews and preprints and books and proceedings and rich media and all sorts of stuff that we need to um, we need to start supporting. And the other point to make as well is that these tend to be, although they're large in number, they tend to have fairly um, easy to answer uh, questions, whereas the, the, the more long-standing members really have the more long-standing systems and the most complex technical issues. Um, so how do we help publishers with um, their uh, uh, metadata? Well, in, in a number of ways, of course, we have um, support tickets. We answer, I think it's over 3,000 a month um, that three people get through every month. We have the forum I mentioned. We also uh, proactively go out and look for questions that we can help with on Twitter, on Stack Exchange, on Reddit. Um, Anna Torwinska runs regular metadata health, metadata health checks and they are one-to-one -one, um, uh, sort of uh, presentations, if you like, and discussions with your organization to um, highlight where there may be some gaps or some um, misunderstandings and she can help any organization improve uh, for their participation and we have those participation reports as well which everyone should be looking at. Um, we're going to introduce a new program so that will be for larger systemic issues we're going to have um, a program that really works hand in hand with such organizations and Jennifer Kemp's going to be leading that and introducing that in 2021. And of course we do research. Um, Patricia is looking into, for example, our data sets category. The uh, data sets contains not just data sets. <laughs> How are we going to manage that? So we're trying to um, look back, uh, learn from the past and also listen to the current members to try and um, to try and improve um, the quality of our metadata and increase the participation of the membership. Um, this chart just shows really where the team spends most of its time and it still is um, on the large publishers. As I mentioned, it is um, the most complex issues. The more the more volume, the more content, the more uh, the more problems, really. Um, and uh, it's good to just kind of like see this spread and see how it's changing over time. Um, uh, so on uh, metadata strategy, that's Patricia Feeney looks after that. She's also in the outreach team, as I mentioned, because uh, there's a, a big part of it is, is monitoring and uh, observing trends in the community. Um, she has a metadata practitioners interest group. Um, which has so many topics that it might have to uh, separate into several different groups in the future. Um, so I'm sure Patricia will talk about that uh, in an update on the blog or the forum soon. She has designed the Crossref Schema 5.0, which we're soon to implement. That includes contributor information like RAW, the Research Organization Registry and Credit. Um, and she's also uh, sort of our eyes and ears out with um, other uh, schemas and other parts of the community, the metadata community. So she's heavily involved in JATS, JATS for R. And um, hopefully if the budget gets approved tomorrow, we will also be uh, developing some tools to um, convert JATS to Crossref and Crossref to JATS, um, which will be a huge help for uh, all of our members. Uh, she also looks at new needs and um, even though we have lots of new content types lately, like grants and peer reviews, um, they always need monitoring. So, so things like the yes, we support grants now, but um, that group is now also interested in facilities. So we have a working group for that. Um, reviews were introduced for journal articles. We need to apply that to preprints. Um, same goes for retractions. Um, and we're also thinking a little bit about provenance as well, um, not just of the content and who contributed to the eventual object, but also um, 
who contributed to the metadata. So um, who deposited it, who did the, um, who's the society, who's the publisher. So we can start to um, track that a little bit, a little bit better. And clearly she works very, very closely with Brian Vickery and his team, the, pro the product management team, and uh, Joe Wass and the software development team to try to figure out how we can have an end-to-end -end approach uh, to all of these amazing new ideas that we need to um, implement and reflect in all of our tools and systems as well. Uh, a new area uh, mentioned at the beginning is um, Rachel Lamy has moved out of the uh, more international outreach area into a, a group called Special Programs that she started and she's still looking after um, preprints and uh, funders and grants and data citation. Um, and really what this is, it allows us to have more focus on some of the newer activities that need dedicated support. So um, of course we still look after, um, you know, uh, the, the previous programs, but they're a bit more part of our regular run of the mill um, operations. So Rachel's looking at new ways um, to work with the community to expand content, metadata and services. And a really good example of that is the grants that we introduced last year. So we have, um, I think about 28 funders who have joined Crossref from lots of different countries actually. And um, they are looking to uh, register their grant records. So openly available metadata that they, that they already have, um, registering those with Crossref, with a DOI, um, eventually to link to the uh, literature so that it can be tracked, people can do analysis and it just will contribute to a much um, a richer picture uh, of how research is supported. So on that, I wanted just to mention, I think Ed already mentioned there were 366 uh, records registered with us, which is a tiny uh, proportion of the 120 million records we have. Um, but I'm going to call that a uh, ta-da because it's been a lot of work to introduce ourselves to some of these organizations. And um, I think they're really happy with this progress, as are we. Um, so like I say, it's a bit early days. We still need to uh, make this metadata retrievable via our APIs. And that's coming soon. Brian will mention that. Um, and uh, you're welcome clearly with, was the first. So they've got 238 and um, just a shout out to Europe PMC as well, who, is, who has really helped us get this off the ground for, for welcome. Here's an example of a landing page for a grant DOI. This is the um, James S. McDonald Foundation. And you can see the very nice looking, um, handsome and beautiful DOI at the top there properly uh, linked with HTTPS <laughs> using the display guidelines. So thank you to the um, James S. McDonald Foundation. Um, I might be going over time. Um, I don't know how anyone would let me know actually, but um, I'm gonna run through, I think I have a few more slides. So um, I wanted to talk about all of these things because these are uh, what we would say are our, pretty much our closest partners. We have currently active um, technical integrations or currently active community projects where we're really um, co-writing uh, uh, papers or we're developing code together or we are um, any, anything where we're not just passively sitting on a committee. So these are true collaborations with these organizations and initiatives here, some examples. Um, one I would like to call out is Metadata 2020. And this is a preview of the new website that's going to be launching in um, a month or two, hopefully before the end of the year. And Metadata 2020 was um, uh, a collaboration with a, about 200 volunteers to uh, discuss and think about the barriers to um, uh, richer metadata and uh, we learned a lot there's a lot of really good resources for metadata practitioners and now the next phase so beyond 2020 is to look at how we can all um, make the link between richer metadata and um, and improving our world so we're going to link metadata um, to the 17 United Nations sustainability goals, the global goals, one of which is zero hunger. Um, 
and so you'll be hearing lots a lot more about about this and um again a, a call out to laura paglione and john chidaki who hugely drive this um uh, volunteer volunteer collaborative program and Finally, I am going to just uh, mention something about this model. This is more looking um, to the future and again thinking just about the team. We are um, uh, currently pretty much at the convey consume end uh, of this model. Um, and that's what you might call traditional marketing, where we have a one to many um, communications approach. We provide interesting information and we hope it's useful. Um, we are hoping to move not just the team, but all of Crossref much further along this um, journey towards true collaboration, um, where we're exchanging knowledge. There's lots of, um, you know, it's an equal partnership between our collaborators and ourselves, and also to co creation um self-organizing working groups and that well that would be a bit of a dream so um hopefully we'll see some of you uh along this journey along the way and that is me i think i went over <laughs> you just you're, you're great it's, it's all good judy fantastic thank you very much so um you did have questions during your presentation but they've been answered by colleagues so um if you'd like to scan while uh, uh brian um, Ryan takes over and, and talks to us about product development. Sure, oh, thanks. Sure. Ryan, can we pass to you? Great. Thanks. I think I've shared my screen. Can you see my first slide? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Fantastic. So thanks so much. Uh, thanks very much, Ginny. Um, my name is Brian Vickery. I'm product director at um, Crossref. Um, I think Ed said that uh, these have been massively challenging times for for all of us um globally with the pandemic um certainly uh, that holds true for the the product team and what we don't know about each other's children and animals is uh, is nobody's business um it's great to have uh, those kids and animals joining us in our um, zoom calls um, every single day um the team has handled a lot of change recently. Um, I joined Crossref in August last year and set about hiring some new team members, working with them all to um, reorganize into the four key um, areas that you can see here, which are content registration, uh, scholarly stewardship, scholarly impact and metadata retrieval. Uh, Sarah joined us in, in April this year from a Crossref member, the uh, Center for Open Science. Uh, she's product manager for membership and, and the content registration mechanisms. She's got up to speed very, very quickly on um, all of the various ways uh, our members register their content with us, uh, including, I have to say, the inconsistencies between, between some of those tools, which we're working hard to address. Um, Sarah's leading with Rakesh, um, our designer, the work on a new um, I'll call it admin system, although that's a, um, just a project's name internally, but I'll come on to that um, in a little bit. Um, kirsty has been with Crossref for, for many years and has been really great at educating the rest of us on what Crossref does. Uh, she retains uh, product management responsibility for services for members around um, how they uh, steward, their, um, steward their content. So similarity check and cross map, cross mark, which Ed's already um, mentioned to you, but also participation reports, which are really um, loved by our members and also the community who look at them quite uh, quite regularly. Uh, Martin joined us from a from another Crossref member in in June. He joined us from MDPI, uh, and he fills the role of product manager for for scholarly impact, um, picking up things like cited by, which Ed's already uh, talked about, uh, but also event data, which really hadn't had very much love. Um, uh, for the whole of 2020, really, until Martin joined. Um, Patrick's role now um, covers two main areas. Uh, he's product manager for metadata retrieval, um, so looks after our, our APIs that metadata, metadata retrieval users um, use, um, but he also spends uh, uh, half of his time acting as our agile manager, so helping us to improve all of our sprint rituals, our issue management, uh, sprint planning, and uh, technical delivery. So he keeps us all in line. And uh, Rakesh has been working um, on, a, on a UI blueprint for the for the whole of the Crossref systems, um, which I, I think if you use them, you'll, um, you'll appreciate need to be 
updated uh, significantly. So um, the blueprint that he's been putting together should give us some huge improvements on user experience in the, in, in the next while. I uh, also wanted to um, show you these faces from the technology team. I know Jeffrey's not talking today, um, but the, the technology team has also um, been going through quite a, a big period of change. Um, 2019 and into 2020 was a, was a knowledge transfer project um, uh, running up to Chuck's departure. Uh, and the product team was really pleased to join in with that effort to help document um, all of the Crossref systems. Um, and uh, learn together what everything does. Um, a, major, a major theme for the technology team has been about opening up our processes um, to product manage everything, uh, which is no small feat, uh, and to make sure that the, the priorities of the technology team and the product team really do match the priorities of the membership and what you expect us, uh, what you expect us to deliver. Um, we've put quite a lot of effort this year into observability. Um, so our system and product monitoring and usage data reporting uh, to guide our decision-making, which is really starting to, uh, to pay off. Um, Mike, Escher and uh, Tim have been working really hard um, on Crossref metadata search, um, Dominica and Escher and others really on, on Elasticsearch, which I'll come on to in a second. And John's done some great work um, pulling out our billing into a separate component. Um, Jason's managing our snapshots for our Metadata Plus users. Tim and Joel are keeping our infrastructure going. And um, if I've forgotten anyone, Joe is, um, Joe remains smiley uh, throughout all of this in managing, managing this kind of cultural and technological uh, transition for Crossref. So um, in the bottom right corner is Panos. Uh, he's our newest uh, member of the team. He joined us this week. And whilst everybody in the team is a star, uh, the two stars represent um, Carlos and Joel, who uh, I haven't got a, got a photograph for. Uh, another main area of focus for the technology team has been addressing um, technical debt. And uh, while technical debt sounds like a horribly doom laden phrase, not all tech debt is bad. All organizations have it, um, Crossref has it, your organizations have it too. And it, it's the result of decisions that we've made, trade-offs we play, shortcuts we have to take to provide the services that the community needs and expects of us when they, when they need it. And Crossref wouldn't have been able to innovate as fast or as much as it has done if it hadn't made those choices when it did. And what's most important is that we, we make the tech debt visible and that we acknowledge it and that we, we start to pay it down. Um, so our, our plan has been and remains to reduce toilsome tasks wherever possible and refactor um, our, our code into components as, as we go. We've made some really, really great progress in terms of automating deployments, um, tools for the support team to manage functions that previously required a developer, um, you know, breaking out the billing code into, into a component to make it easier to, uh, to update and, and to manage. There's lots more that we can do it's not always visible to the outside world, to our, to our members and our users, but those changes are important and uh, we're conscious of them as we, as we take Crossref forward. So given that the product team was relatively new, um, we decided to embark on a series of product reviews. Um, so for each of the main products, services or tools. Um, we started a, a review to try and understand the history, uh, the technical choices that we've made, uh, who is using it, who's not using it, uh, the, the, the KPIs, the successes, and, and to, uh, to look to the community for advice on, on future development of those, um, of those tools. As a result of that, we uh, refreshed two of our working groups. Uh, so similarity check and distributed usage logging working groups were reinvigorated with new members uh, and uh, we've developed a much more outcomes driven approach to prioritization activities focusing on things that make it easier for our members and users to to work with us so Ginny mentioned the number of support requests that come in and, and we, we use those to kind of benchmark the things that we need to to tackle um, with the highest priority um, internally we're holding a lot of prioritization sessions um, to determine what to work on next. Um, there are a couple of um, product reviews we haven't um, completed yet. And I saw a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, one of those is around co-access for books. 
Um, so we're hoping to, to start the review of that very soon. And so if people who are posting those comments would uh, be happy to be interviewed uh, about co-access, then uh, that would be great. Please let us know so we can get in touch with you. And then the other, the other area is, uh, is, is cross-ref metadata search. So I mentioned um, very briefly the project's name, um, the Admin Center, and um, we've heard from, from our members, service providers and users that they, they really value the services Crossref provides, including reporting and helper tools and applications for them to register metadata like Metadata Plus and, and the web deposit form. But these are often scattered in many different places across our, our sites, and they're not always as connected as, as you would like them to be. Um, they also have um, wildly different um, user interfaces, uh, and therefore the user experiences can be a little bit difficult. There are also some things that our members just can't do for themselves that they have to ask us to do on their behalf. Um, so we're currently working on the concept of a, of, of a new tool, uh, the admin um, center, if you like, uh, to bring together um, all membership information, including contacts, user information, uh, reports, your, your content registration uh, into a single interface uh, to make those tools easy for you to find and, and, and to use. We're not um, simply reskinning things, we're assessing everything as we go uh, to see how useful and used it is and taking that data-driven approach um, to, to connect the dots and find the things that are most useful to, to tackle first. So I think the admin center is, is likely to, to live as a companion to the other tools through 2021, um, solving some key challenges that are difficult for, for members to achieve right now, such as a title transfers um, between one member and another member, which has a knock-on effect for updating the resource URLs and also updating various other pieces of metadata um, that the previous publisher or member has, has registered. Um, and understanding the number of um, DOIs that come with that, um, that transfer transaction. So I think this is gonna live um, alongside uh, the other tools, but slowly but surely we'll be um, bringing everything into this one unified tool for you. Uh, Ginny mentioned this, but um, you know, we, we don't get to see each other face to face um, uh, as often, well, not at all <laughs> at the moment. And, uh, and therefore these other mechanisms for um, providing feedback to Crossref um, you know, are increasingly important. As we build out the admin center, your um, input is vital to the success of that so that we make sure that we get these tools right and that we solve the problems that are most important for you. And please do continue to contact us. The, the community forum is a really great place for you to ask your questions. Uh, and we are uh, using the community form to provide answers to. Um, we'll be sending out a lot more surveys um, in, in the coming weeks and months about the admin center, um, launching some testing groups to look at the designs and the user flow um, and, also, and also the prototypes. Um, and for those who, are, uh, who wish to, you can use uh, gitlab.com com uh, slash crossref and uh, raise your own issues with us if you if you want and that'll get straight into our straight into our processes um i will skip that one uh, so um something which is coming up um quite imminently uh, in terms of improving our services is um is the ability to uh, log into our systems using uh, user credentials uh, personal credentials for you um, right now, all users log in with a Crossref, Crossref uh, system account, um, and that can be quite difficult for um, organizations with a lot of staff that are trying to log into the same uh, account, uh, or, or also for sponsoring organizations. Um, so we've been working hard on a new authenticator system uh, behind the scenes, and that will allow users to manage their own um, personal user credentials and password. Um, for for logging into the system, so that should be uh, that should be coming uh, hopefully before the end of the year. Um, we've also been um, working hard on our REST API. Uh, our APIs serve more than six hundred million requests a month, um, and huge numbers of users, different use cases from from publishers and members themselves to research councils and funders to 
archives and repositories, peer review management systems are all using a cross-ref metadata um, for a range of different purposes, including verifying records, filling gaps, uh, citation matching. Um, this usage just continues to grow um, and uh, we've been working on improving the REST API for quite some time and I've had a code freeze uh, for a year um, on this, meaning we haven't been able to add content types or functionality like um, grants, uh, as Jimmy was mentioning. So um, this work is, is ongoing. Um, we're migrating from Solar to Elasticsearch to address some uh, long-standing scalability uh, issues um, and modernizing our in infrastructure and moving it to um, Amazon Web Services. Um, so the cut over to the um, new API uh, is in the planning. Um, we'll have more on that um, pretty soon, hopefully. Uh, I just wanted to touch on, on a couple of the products. Um, so similarity check, which is our service is the service used by members to uh, detect um, overlap um, with previously published work. Um, this is a service that uh, members opt into. Uh, there are additional fees uh, associated with, with similarity check, but if you're not currently using it um, and you would like to, to check your um, incoming content, then, uh, then please have a look on our website for more details and, and uh, contact us. Um, this year we've been migrating members over to a new agreement which is directly with Crossref uh, and that's nearly complete. We've also been working with uh, Turnitin, the uh, technology partner, to uh, roll out enhancements to uh, authenticate improvements to the, um, to the uh, report viewer, um, the accessibility and searchability within that and also improved exclusion options such as excluding uh, matches for um, references. Um, there is a member obligation um, and members that use the service need to make sure that they're maintaining uh, 60, uh, 90 percent of their content having similarity checking URLs. Uh, in the new version of I Authenticate, there is a content portal for members to see um, how much of their content is, is currently uh, carrying similarity checking URLs. So I'd, I'd urge you all to, to take a look at that. Um, and something which has come up very recently is that uh, similarity check reports are matching um, a preprint to the incoming manuscript. And so we'll be giving guidance to editors on um, how to uh, make sure they don't reject articles simply because it's matched to the author's own preprint. Um, I'm really running out of time and haven't got very uh, far through this presentation. Um, Ed mentioned Crossmark. Um, uh, it's a service that uh, allows a user uh, viewing a, a full, uh, an HTML version of an article or, or a PDF to click a button and see whether or not the status of that um, is current. Um, as I said, we removed the fees uh, for participating in Crossmark earlier on in the year. Um, and since then, we've had a dramatic change in the number of uh, content items that are carrying Crossmark metadata um, up 12%. Uh, uh, that's that's fantastic. Um, there's still a lot of members that don't know what it is or what the value of it is. So uh, we wanted to highlight that here. Um, and also, um, probably within the next hour, <laughs> we're extending um, support for peer reviews. So uh, members uh, will be able to um, register peer reviews that are related to other content types. Um, right now, it's, it's been for journal articles, um, but we're rolling out support for um, reviews of books, book chapters, and, and preprints of, as of today. And that's, um, there's been a real community push um, for uh, registering um, peer reviews of, uh, of preprints, especially. Um, just to say that um, we um, can automatically push works to somebody's ORCID profile um, if the publisher or member includes the ORCID uh, um, ID in the metadata. Um, we've made some changes with ORCID recently. Um, the, the process is that we have to ask the author for permission to automatically update their profile. I'm really pleased that those, um, those changes have seen a significant uptick in the number of authors granting us. Uh, permission to automatically update their, their profiles. We're currently at about 58%. Um, an initiative that launched earlier on in the year um, was I4OA. It's uh, an initiative to um, 
persuade is a call to publishers to deposit their abstracts with Crossref as part of their their metadata. Um, since the start of the year, we've seen two and a half million abstracts um, loaded to uh, registered with Crossref, which is uh, fantastic growth. Uh, all time for journal articles, around nine percent of those records have an abstract um, with them. But for 2020, it, it's it's right up at 25 uh, 25 percent. Um, so that's really going well. Um, if you're a member, please take a look at your participation reports and see if you are uh, registering abstracts with us. Uh, and if not, please consider um, doing so. Uh, uh, I'll skip slide to buy. Um, in terms of uh, collaborating with others, I think it's fair to say that event data, which uh, creates links between works with the Crossref DOI and uh, mentions of that work in diverse places such as Wikipedia or Twitter. Um, this was something that we, we launched a year or so ago, but we have, uh, we've had some problems with the, with the API. Uh, we've been really struggling to uh, provide the resource necessary to, to sort, this, uh, sort this out to make it performant. Um, I'm pleased to say with Martin coming on board um, and with Joe's um, activities that we've been able to deploy a new API uh, for event data yesterday. Um, and so uh, those of you that are interested in this kind of, uh, this kind of event should see a, a much more stable um, API. We chose to switch over to the new API um, uh, before we'd fully um, uh, indexed all of the events um, in, into the API. Um, because the stability of the previous one um, wasn't good enough. But I think we've, we've nearly got 400 million uh, events in, in the API um, already for you. Um, so that's a great progress. Um, I also wanted to flag, I think we've got some colleagues here from uh, PKP. Um, we're working very closely um, with, um, with PKP. It's a great example of collaboration that involves both our technical as well as our community um, integration, co-development, uh, as well as for formal partnerships in, in outreach. Um, we have a joint working group led by Susan, uh, currently finalizing uh, a statement of work with PKP, which will simplify management of, um, of DOI registration um, and consolidate the various, AP, uh, the various plugins that PKP provides um, for Crossref uh, related services. So that's work that we hope to kick off very, very, very soon. Um, so just to wrap up, um, these are the things that we're trying to uh, finalize as best we can um, this year, um, rolling out the new version of similarity checks. So some of you I know are testing um, this for us. So thank you very much for, for the feedback on that. Um, we still require integration with the manuscript tracking systems um, for those that use, say, Editorial Manager or Scholar One, um, but that's in progress. Um, peer reviews for content like uh, preprint should go live today. Um, the REST API migration is, is progressing well. Um, we'll have some more news on that, and uh, hopefully our schema 5.0 um, update will, will start to roll out um, before the end of the year. Um, we're introducing user credentials um, uh, very soon uh, and developing the um, admin center proposal and uh, seeking feedback from you. I just wanted to mention two other things very, very quickly. Um, one is uh, improving the quality of metadata. Um, so um, our APIs serve 600 million requests a month, as I said, and there are many different use cases. For that, um, our publishers and members really want to provide uh, accurate metadata, but you know sometimes sometimes mistakes happen. Uh, people just don't know where to report that problem. Um, often they think the problem lies with Crossref, and so they they report it to us by email, and we have to forward that email on to the the member. But we're not able to really track those corrections or updates that are made on a on any kind of scale. Um, so. We're considering, we're just starting to think about building a, a kind of a tracking mechanism, um, working out how to manage community assertions on that data. Uh, we've done some thinking about it, um, but my hope is that you know, Crossref becomes this hub uh, where the community can report and track issues with, uh, with metadata with the, with the aim to improve that metadata for everybody. 
and I will uh, we'll just mention multilingual. I know that a question came up about that um, earlier on. We have been um, uh, we have uh, Jeffrey did some analysis, some automatic language detection on on a sample of crossref um, content, um, and uh, we know that there is content there um, in non English um, languages. Um, I think we have started to set up a small working group to look at multilingual metadata. Um, and I know that there are a few people on the call who are interested in taking part in that. So um, I'll leave that there because I'm out of time and um, hand it over to Lucy. Okay, thank you. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Lucy Ofeish. I am the Director of Finance and Operations here at Crossref. Um, I, we're going to go over some of our sort of financial performance for the year um, and also we'll transition into the governance portion of the meeting um, and finalize the board election. Um, so just to start, I joined Crossref a little under a year ago. Um, the finance and operations team has uh, six members to it in addition to me. We oversee Crossref's business operations, um, including finance, HR, governance, and legal. Um, and this is the team. They're, they have really uh, worked hard this year to um, navigate both the transition in the position that I'm in and also all the sort of changing circumstances that presented themselves this year. Um, so when I joined, we set out with some initial operational goals, um, which one of them was sort of building a culture of resource planning within the organization. Um, and when we talk about a culture of resource planning, we're really thinking about um, are two of our key resources, one being money and one being time. Um, and so when we talk about organizational sustainability, we're really talking about it more broadly than financial performance. So in addition to sort of drilling into the financial performance of the organization, we're also looking at how are we using our time? Does it align with our goals in places where, um, you may encounter toil in some of our internal processes. Those are resource consuming and those can um, hinder the growth, can hinder the organization's growth because toil can cripple scale. So um, we're in some of our planning thinking about um, where we may be saving money but wasting time. Um, and uh, as we look into 2021 and think about how we are prioritizing our investments of resources in ways that will make us more efficient, uh, more effective uh, in the long term. And so I think sustainability planning really requires a more holistic approach to resource planning. Um, the other thing that the organization or that the team tackled this year was um, we do have staff, we have a distributed team. Um, right now we are distributed across five countries, each with varying employment practices. So we undertook a review of our policies to determine it, uh, to what extent there's a feeling of equity across the team um, while still complying with whatever is the local obligations that we have where our staff is um, yeah, where our staff currently lives. Um, and then the team also has worked to better integrate the finance perspective into product and membership experiences. So working more closely with um, Brian's product team and um, Amanda and Ginny on the membership side to really understand what the experience of being a Crossref member is from, from the financial perspective. Um, and so as is often the case when you start a new role, um, you'll come into big surprises. The sort of global pandemic was definitely a new one, but um, 
we quickly, you know, a couple months into, after I started a couple months into the year, um, we had to pivot pretty quickly to make sure we were, we had tracking in place to anticipate um, if we were gonna see any slowdown in some of our business performance. Um, and we also had to support the staff as they transitioned to being an all remote team. Um, and so, and we'll talk a little bit about FY20's performance uh, in the following slides, but um, just, you know, our kind of initial reaction was really to make sure we were slowing any significant investments, sequencing some of our plan spending, and just being sure that we were um, being cautious and conservative as we waited to see how, how the year was, was going to perform. Um, so this gives you a sense of the 10 years of Crossref's financial performance. Crossref has grown steadily throughout its history. Um, you can see here about the last 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, we had revenue and expense of just under 5 million. We'll end this year just under 10 million. Um, but that growth has been steady and gradual over time. And so I think a lot of the stability of Crossref can be contributed to that gradual growth. You don't see those big stair steps in, um, in growth that requires sort of stair steps in operations to go along with it. So um, I think we're, we, as we, while we continue to see growth this year, as we think about next year and the, and the sort of subsequent years after, um, we're hedging some of our assumptions and, and sort of just being conservative. Um, and then this gives you a sense of how our revenue streams compare over the years. Content registration is the largest share of our revenue. Um, that has started to trend down a bit. Um, content registration was pretty consistently around 63% of revenue. Uh, when we dropped the crossmark fee this year, that dipped that percentage share by a few points um, to probably the high 50th percentile. Um, as SimCheck and other new service lines grow, we'll continue to see some rebalancing of those income streams, but it will you know, be gradual over time. So 2020 performance so far to date, we, as of September 30th, revenue is nearly on budget. Um, it's off by just about 1%. Um, annual membership revenue continues to grow as does content registration. Um, expenses are well under budget. Uh, we're under budget by about 17%. Um, we had a lot of savings from not traveling this year and just generally controlling expenses due to the uncertainty of the year. Um, like I mentioned, the we have reduced costs where we can in terms of we've temporarily closed our offices. One of our offices, we downsized another one. And we just want to act early, um, particularly on variable expenses so that we can build some cushion that uh, should we start to experience any slowdown in the coming years, we've taken, we've acted early and, and kind of built up a little uh, reserve. Um, but we're forecasting a healthy operating net for the year. Um, and uh, the other thing that we're, we're also mindful of is that the, a lot of the content that we register has about a six to 12 month lead time. So we're substantially registering content this year that was submitted um, to our members last year. So um, keeping, we may not see, we're, we may still be dealing with a lot of pre-COVID um, content at this point. So uh, we're keeping a close eye on it. We're actually, we're tracking content type submission um, at the per type level every month and looking at where it was last year, just so that we can anticipate any um, slowdown earlier um, rather than, than later. Um, let's see, I'm just keeping an eye on time. Time. Um, okay. okay, so 21 budget, the board is meeting um, in the next couple of days over to this afternoon and, and tomorrow. So we don't have a final budget to share, but 
um, I can give you kind of the overview of what we're thinking. The, um, we are forecasting not a lot of growth. We're basically forecasting flat growth from our, from our, um, from our financial scenarios that we built within this year. Um, and keeping any res any revenue growth conservative, uh, we we do have we in our twenty one expense planning. We're kind of assuming twenty one is another unusual year, um, so not ramping up some of those things around travel and meetings and and those costs significantly. Um, and then kind of taking the year to really think about how we prioritize um, you know, our two main resources of time and money to tackle some of these projects and that Ginny and Brian mentioned and, and um, really ones that, that will benefit from the time gained from not doing a lot of travel and, and um, being able to, to support some of those priorities that we'll have kind of in a short-term project way. Um, so while we so while we don't necessarily have any indicators of slowdown, we're just going to go into the year assuming that we need to err on the side of being conservative, and then you know hopefully the year performs better than than we anticipate. Um, we're going to do governance following this, but before I do that, I wanted to open up for any questions on the financials. I have to close out of my full screen so I can actually see those questions. Looking now, um, Lucy, um, and I, no questions have been posted yet. Okay. Okay, great. Well, keeping on time, let's move then into um, governance, sorry, I have to reshare here. Okay, so um, the next piece of our meeting before we wrap up um, will be the governance annual meeting and board election. Um, oops, sorry. So uh, I am also secretary of the board um, and I will be joined for this section by Emily Cook, who is our um, outside legal counsel. Um, and sorry, Emily, did you say something? No, hi, just saying hi. hi. Okay, great, we can hear you. Um, so this is a business portion of the annual meeting when the board of directors is elected and we have a couple motions that we'll do. We're gonna do these by um, calling for a motion. Someone will raise their hand, we'll unmute them. They can make the motion. A different person will raise their hand to second that motion, we'll unmute them. And this is the modern age of governance. So um, let's jump in. Uh, okay, so just a quick overview and I've, some of this Ed already covered so I won't go through all of it, um, but just an overview of how Crossref's board functions. Um, the board, the director is an employee or an officer of a member organization. The board seat actually belongs to the member organization. Um, board members can serve three-year terms and are eligible for re-election. There aren't any set term limits. A few of the folks that were nominated this year are nominated for re-election to their seats. Um, we have the corporate officers, the chair and treasurer are elected by the board um, at the first meeting of the new year. Um, and those positions serve for one year for up to three consecutive years. Um, so the role of the board uh, at Crossref is to provide the strategic and financial oversight of the organization um, and work closely with the executive director and the leadership team uh, to steer the organization in its direction and then to also act as fiduciaries um, to ensure the financial security and governance of the organization. The board meets three times a year. A lot of this work actually happens at the committee level um, and we have a really active set of committees uh, that every board member sits on. Um, 
So with that being said, we are going to start the business portion um, of the annual meeting. So formally, the notice of this meeting was sent on September 30th of 2020 to all Crossref members of record. Um, there were, as of the Crossref members of record, as of September 14th, um, there were 12,768 members of Crossref who were eligible to vote in the election that followed. Um, our quorum, which is the minimum number required to convene this meeting, is 100 people. We had 1,301 members participate via proxy, um, and that's in addition to the folks that have gathered here today on the Zoom meeting. Um, I will pass it to Emily to discuss the uh, board seat elections. Hi, everyone. Sorry, you can't see me. Um, Crossref's board is comprised of 16 members. Each of those board members, as most of you know, is an employee of a Crossref member organization and serves a three-year term. Each year, about a third of, that, of the board seats are up for election. And this year, of course, there are six board seats to be filled. In accordance with Crossref's bylaws, the board is structured to maintain a rough balance between member tiers based on revenue size. The nominees each cycle are chosen by Crossref's nominating committee. That's a group of representatives from five Crossref members. Um, in accordance with Crossref's historical practice, uh, three of those typically serve on the board at a given time and two who don't. And none of the folks on the nominating committee come from member organizations that have put a candidate on the slate. The purpose of the nominating committee is to review and create the slate each year for nominations to the board with an eye to maintaining representation of the broader Crossref membership. This year's NOMCOM included the individuals listed here, and we are very grateful to them for their service. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Emily. Um, and then I just wanted to give a quick overview on the nomination process. So um, the committee started by conducting a review of the board's current composition to help inform how to build a slate that would complement the um, existing board. Then we issued a call, a public call for expressions of interest. Um, we received, and board members who are currently seated um, went through the same process as those that were expressing interest for the first time. So we received 72 responses to our call, which was a big jump from last year. Um, the committee met over a series of meetings and reviewed every response um, and discussed the candidates, the short list, they kind of whittled to a short list and um, the short list candidates went through interviews with the a pair of members from the nominating committee. Um, and then the committee came back together and, and settled on the final slate. Um, I will make a quick plug for if you're interested in doing this next year and putting yourself forward, stay tuned for the call that should come out about April or May of next year. Um, we had a really great group this year. The committee had a tall task of whittling it down to a short list. Um, and I just want to thank them again because they spent many, many hours uh, dedicated to this process. And I think we came up with a great slate. Um, and so at this point now, we will, oh, there we go. Uh, the nominating committee's recommended slate of eight candidates for this year's six board seats are as follows. Um, in the small organization tier, we have Marin Dacos, Keong Kim, Abel Packer, Wendy Patterson, and Jesse Zhao. Um, in the tier two seats, we have Liz Allen, James Phil Potts, and Jason Wild, each representing their respective organizations. Um, and at this time, I'm going to ask if I have a motion to formally place these names into nomination. Uh, Hi, Lucy. I have a couple of raised hands here. So just give me a moment to unmute and allow them to speak. Um, okay. And if you would please introduce yourself and um, tell us your membership organization. Hi, this is Rose Rullier from Elsevier. 
Um, I would like to put forward this motion uh, to put the names on the slate. Thank you, Rose. Do I have a second? Aye. 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 Hello, could you state your name and your organization? Yeah, my name is Zolu Joshua. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. My name is Olu Joshua uh, from Lou George Ventures Limited. I second the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so earlier in the meeting, Ed mentioned that the um, ballot was closing. So we actually have the final slate that we're gonna share. Um, the election was held using a third party platform, e-ballot, um, using the voter voting contacts on record as of September 14th. Um, the election is now closed and um, we are going to welcome our 2021 board class um, for the tier one seats that will include Marin Dacos, Keong Kim, Abel Packer, Wendy Patterson, um, and the tier two seats will welcome Liz Allen and James Philpotts. So thank you to those that voted. We had a really good um, showing and, and welcome to the um, next class of board members. Um, so at this point, we can conclude the uh, formal business part of the meeting and then pass over to Ed for um, the wrap up. Does anyone have questions, new business they'd like to raise before we adjourn the business portion of the meeting? Okay. Um, yes, I've got a raised hand here. Just a moment. Well, I unmute them. And if you would just state your name and your member organization. Thank you. Yeah, this is Andrew Smeal from Hindawi, and I'd like to uh, move to adjourn this portion of the meeting. Okay. Um, do we have a second to adjourn? I second that, Melissa Harrison from Eli. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I will pass it back to Ed. Great, thank you very much. And um, I think uh, we can uh, just see my slides here, I believe. <laughs> Great. So uh, happy to uh, be uh, here to, uh, to 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 wrap up uh, the day uh, yeah, and just confirm I'm I'm still the executive director of, of Crossref, which I'm I'm very pleased about. And uh, thank you very much uh, for um, uh, for 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 our our speakers who've um, uh, done a great job today. And and thank you to Lucy and Emily uh, for for running a very efficient uh, uh, very efficient election. And um, uh, I, I'd welcome to the to the uh, to the new board members uh, who will be starting their terms uh, uh, next year at our, our March uh, board meeting. So just to uh, provide a few final thoughts uh, to, to to wrap up here today, uh, one of the things that um, uh, we had talked about uh, earlier was just the 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 impact of all the events during this year uh, on on the Crossref strategy uh, and 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 the staff. So I just wanted to touch on a few final points and say that we've been participating in a, in, a, in a great initiative. It's the uh, organized by a number of different uh, uh, associations, uh, the ALPSP Association, SSP, a number of others. But uh, you can see on the on the website. So we are a signatory. Uh, to the principles and a, and a member of the Coalition for Diversity and Inclusion in, in Scholarly uh, Communications. And so we are uh, uh, working on, uh, they have some great toolkits and, and, and other information uh, and, and we're uh, supporting this organization, but also looking at how we can make concrete changes uh, at, at Crossref uh, to, to improve uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, uh, Rosa sent a link to our, our code of conduct, which governs not just our meetings, but all our interactions uh, with, with, within the organization and with, with our members and, and part of the community. I think this is, this is uh, re really important. Uh, and also we've been working with our uh, executive committee of the board 
uh, to uh, review uh, the Crossref uh, policies. Uh, Lucy touched on on some of that. We've we've actually already uh, uh, updated some of our uh, recruitment practices uh, to get a, a broad um, uh, broad set of uh, diverse candidates for for any job that that we're hiring and making sure that it's a fair and transparent process. Uh, and and so 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 there's a lot of work and thinking going on about that uh, at, at at Crossref. So it's it's an ongoing process, and it and it's something that we're uh, taking taking very uh, taking very seriously. We've made made some changes already, and we'll and we'll be making more uh, as we um, as 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 we go forward. We've also been having a series of staff meetings this year. We've been working with uh, uh, external facilitators uh, and we're taking sessions uh, where we uh, don't talk about day-to-day -day business, but we take a step back and talk about uh, how we interact, how we communicate, uh, what practical changes can we make to uh, work together online more effectively. Because as we've been saying throughout this meeting, you know, we're, we're, these these are not nor normal circumstances for working at home, and uh, with everybody being online, you know, we can't just take uh, uh, old practices and 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 just try to try to replicate what happened in in face to face situations and try to replicate them online. And and so we've been talking about uh, how we use the tools that we use more more effectively, and uh, and and so this is been really great, and uh, and and it's uh, some something that's ongoing, and and just. Um, a positive note here that that working with our uh, external consultants, uh, we've done we've done surveys of staff, and we did a survey in June and October this year about uh, uh, the what's called the six senses of teamwork. So how how we all interact and the teams work together, and how we work as one team is Crossref looking at uh, purpose, responsi responsibility, generosity, integrity, inclusion, and uh, and trust and. Uh, it's good to see that uh, the numbers from June to October uh, improved, and the consultants actually said that um, that it's unusual to have an organization with such uh, such high scores. You know, we, we want to take that with a with with a pinch of salt, but uh, but you know the the discussions we have uh, and the environment and culture we have at Crossref is is, is re really positive, and 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 we want to try and uh, uh, build on that going going forward because again. Uh, that will enable us to uh, to fulfill our mission, serve our members better, and serve the broader community, uh, and 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 really driving to those bigger goals that we have around uh, open infrastructure uh, and 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 open research. So so you know it hasn't always been an easy year, but again we're we're trying to be intentional about uh, uh, what what we're doing and uh, and and how we do it. So just to highlight, you've seen uh, some of the uh, uh, different teams, but uh, our people are very important. So a huge thank you to the, to the Crossref team. Um, uh, it's a fantastic group of people. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see on our website, uh, we've, we've got that. And we also have an organization chart where you can, where you can see what, what the different teams are. Uh, so one of the downsides of, of being face-to-face, -face, uh, being together face-to-face -to -face less is that we haven't been able to get Great photos for uh, for for everyone, but uh, but we'll be filling those in um, as as we um, as we go along. And um, uh, yeah, so again, just just a huge huge thank you to the uh, to the Crossref Crossref staff. Uh, a plug for a conference that's coming up that Crossref is involved in with a number of different organizations: uh, California Digital Library, uh, Data Site, uh, Orchid, uh, NISO, and 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 others. Uh, is that um, uh, it's this conference called Pitapalooza. If you haven't heard of it before, it's a it's a festival of persistent identifiers. Uh, I think this will be the fourth one, <laughs> uh, but it, it started a number number of years ago. The last one was uh, you can see in Lisbon, in Portugal, the picture the picture at the top the top here uh, of that of that get together. So uh, some serious topics, but a little bit of a uh, bit of fun as as well. So this is now a uh, moving online and it's actually going to be taking place over 24 hours. So they're going to be regional events. Uh, so so take a look, sign up. Uh, and, and I think there's going to be a great program that again, taking advantage of the online environment, we'll be able to have a, a really great uh, inclusive, uh, inclusive, uh, inclusive atmosphere going forward. So it's really all about uh, pulling together for open, open infrastructure. 
Um, I think I just wanted to touch on a couple of lar larger themes here about uh, it's really critical. Trust, trust and respect is really important. Uh, we want to work with our collaborations and work with others in the community to to achieve this this wider mission. Um, uh, we have to approach it with with humility. Um, uh, we've got a great team team at Crossref. Uh, we want to move on from some of the past misperception, uh, and Crossref has a really great. Uh, a great a clear direction in, in terms of its strategy going going forward. But of course, we don't want to forget the basics uh, just around uh, metadata and ease of use. And you've heard a lot today uh, from, from Brian and uh, from Ginny about how we're engaging with the community, how we're, we're working on improving our, our, our services. So, so there's always a lot, lot to do, but, but I think we're well positioned to uh, really make uh, uh, the rest of this year and then particularly 2021 uh, a year where, where, where we can make some uh, sensible investments uh, we can improve uh, improve our systems and, and take advantage of the resilience that we have and the financial stability really to to uh, build for the future and put us on a good track uh, for for uh, even better success over the over the next uh, 20 uh, 20 years but 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 we we are listening and learning from others that I think I think that's really important we we, we, we don't have all the we don't have all the answers uh, but we we really have to uh, uh, join together if we're going to uh, uh, yeah, make this uh, make make this a success. So, uh, just uh, again, a huge uh, thank you to um, to to Rosa for 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 moderating and organizing uh, this the session today, and for all the all the speakers. Thank thank you very much. I think uh, uh, that's that's been really fantastic, and also uh, for all the attendees. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for, for for coming today. But I'll just uh, do you want to have any final words, uh, Rosa? Or, or anyone else on the Crossref team? I'll just, just you know, uh, this slide right here, the keeping in touch is important. Um, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And just really in short, a big thank you for everyone that attended and, and stayed with us pretty much the entire time. Yes, yes, thanks again. I mean, it's been really great having so many people uh, online, I think we're up to over over 200, 220 at, at, at one point. That's that's double what we would normally get at a face-to-face -face meeting. So I think that's really fantastic. Uh, we've we've re uh, re recorded this, so it'll be available. We'll make the slides available uh, as well. And thank you to everybody who who asked questions. Uh, uh, it's been great to have that interaction and and feedback. So if there's nothing else, I think we can. Uh, wrap up the 2020 annual meeting and um uh yeah it's been great thanks everyone and uh we will be in touch as we go forward and uh hope to uh uh to see many of you people in 2021 thanks everyone bye-bye thanks everyone bye-bye